There we go. You've got it. We're being officially recorded. This is the best time to record the employment vertical because we've got a very lively info jam-packed call today. I'll trust that some other folks will join us in progress and the recording will help with anyone who wanted to attend live but couldn't make it due to a schedule conflict. So welcome one and all to our spring employment update. We're delighted to keep you updated on developments that continue to unfold much like unpredictable spring weather. And right now in Southern California, you know, between yesterday and today, we never know what to expect. Same thing with the employment landscape across the country. So please note, uh, we are recording the call. We, we do have some limited time and we have three expert learned speakers. So we're thrilled. We want you to participate. You can raise your hand um, under reactions. You can also put your questions in the chat and I'll do my best to monitor that as we have our speakers. So let me introduce our three speakers. Dan Foreman, who's been a regular with us. He's in Los Angeles with CDF Labor Law, and he's going to discuss federal regulations against non-competes. So this is spreading across the nation. We're going to get a great update from Dan. Nancy Whitehead from Scott and Whitehead in Orange County, California. She's going to help us with our California corner on arbitration agreements in the Golden State. And then Dane Stephenson in Atlanta also a regular on our calls. He's going to keep us informed about the growing popular trend of states adopting privacy laws and what those cover. <clears throat> As a quick reminder, our purpose is to educate and explore relevant employment issues. We are limited in time, but we do want to have your questions and your participation. Uh, we'll trust that you're going to be professional, tactful, and uh, enter into the conversation with respect for speakers and other attendees. Please don't include a personal agenda. We are all experienced professionals in our respective fields. Uh, we love to learn out loud though, so we wanna hear from you. Last but not least, I would like to know if there are future topics that you'd like to learn more about. So feel free to either uh, email me directly or in the chat. We'd love to be able to hear from you and keep this relevant and informative. Well, without any further delay, I'm gonna, Turn the, the mic over to Dan Foreman to kick us off with non-competes and the growing regulations for that across the nation. Take it away, Dan. Great, thanks, Anita. And thanks everybody for being here. As Anita mentioned, I am the, uh, I'm a CDF labor law and we are, we call ourselves California's Council to Employers or Council to California Employers because we focus in on California employment law on the employer side. That said, I also practice a lot of trade secret work, uh, including prosecution. So I'm on both sides of the of the V for those cases. Um, and I do some uh, executive consultations for exit agreements and entrance agreements. So we have a variety, wide variety here. And I am here to talk about what I call the Californication of uh, the law. Um, in this case, non-compete law. Um, California adopted uh, by the Supreme Court many years ago, uh, basically in the employment context, it is illegal and a violation of public policy for employers to engage employees under a non-compete uh, that would infringe on their right of mobility, uh, their, their, the, the ability to work in their trade and profession. And that had spread to a few states um, in recent times. But this year, the Biden administration, this isn't political, this is just a fact, um, and the FTC have really waged a war on non-competes. The, the FTC has published regulations that will bar non-competes in the employment context throughout the country. Um, and it is even more what I would call restrictive or, or more employee friendly than the California law currently is. Um, and I'm gonna put in the chat, a blog piece that I just wrote on it and published last week. So if you, you want to dig down into the details of the regs later on, take a look at, at my blog piece on this. Um, the regulations are currently, you know, in the comment period, which ends April 19th. So, uh, you know, keep your eyes on on the news if this is of interest to you, because it, it could become a regulation relatively soon. It will take effect within, or I should say, 180 days after the regulations published, absent litigation to stay or stop 
uh, the prosecution of litigation of, of the regulations. But in addition to these regulations, and I'll talk a little bit more about them um, and certainly try to answer questions, but I know we're on a limited time budget. Uh, the FTC is also engaged in litigation against employers. Um, they started doing this a number of years ago as it relates to uh, what we call non-poach agreements where, where potentially competitive employers agree with each other not to hire each other's employees or agree to have certain levels of compensation for certain types of employees. And uh, the, the FTC has been uh, prosecuting those cases both civilly and criminally in the last couple of years. They have not been successful in any criminal prosecutions yet, but they're learning, they will be. Um, and so what we have now seen this year is aside from the regulations the FTC has come out and prosecuted at least four employers uh, for imposing non-compete agreements on their employees under an antitrust theory. So in other words, the, the theory being that having non-compete agreements um, is anti-competitive in the marketplace. It, it, it creates a non-competitive environment for salaries and compensation. Um, and decreases or increases the hurdles to competition and new entrants to these markets. Um, so some really interesting stuff out there to, to keep everybody's eyes on and attention to. And obviously it's important uh, that we all do that. I will note that the regulations do have an exception probably in the banking area um, and the FTC, similar to its enforcement of the uh, non-poach agreements, also recognizes that a non-compete can be useful and, and legal under the rule of reason in the uh, franchise, franchise, franchise or franchisee relationship. Um, and so that's, you know, uh, it's a fairly definitive and limited exception, but it is, it is in the proposed regs, it's recognized in the proposed regs. So um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take some questions or uh, I can talk some more, but it's pretty interesting. I guess the the what I the one thing I, I should emphasize is that California has recognized that um, a non compete is enforceable when it is used to protect the goodwill of a business. So when a business is sold, the owner can agree not to compete with the purchaser of the business is to protect to protect its goodwill. And in California, there's been uh, some case law on that that has recognized that even a relatively small percentage of total equity is considered su sufficiently substantial to enforce a non-compete. Uh, the, however, the, the federal regulations that, that are out there will require or will allow, I should say, enforceability of a non-compete if the owner owned at least 25% of the business at the time they entered into the non-compete. So they have to be a, a substantial owner of that business that then gets sold in order to enforce a non-compete. The California case, I think enforced a non-compete where there was less than 3% of the equity that was required for the sale of the business and required for the non-compete to be enforced, um, where the court considered that to be substantially related to the reason why the person bought the business because they weren't gonna buy the business unless all the owners agreed to a non-compete. Um, it's pretty incredible. Um, it's pretty amazing. There's over 20,000 comments right now. Uh, and I didn't do a survey, but I sort of glanced through them. Most of them are seem to be from individuals and from unions supporting the new regulations. Um, I did see some from employers, but you know, there's not, not a lot out there. And my sense is that, you know, if there's a trade organization, um, you know, and whether it's in high tech or, uh, other areas, you know, that where where they really feel the need to uh, enforce non-competes. I'm thinking biotech, you know, medical technology. A lot of the tech tech companies will really uh, be impacted by this. So um, anyway, they they could come together and seek some kind of injunction against these regulations, uh, but we will see. So stay tuned, um, and I will pass the baton or answer any questions. Dan, thank you so much for covering that. I've got a question that I think in, in clients, in the minds of our clients, sometimes gets muddied with the non-compete. So for a client who's worked so hard to build up their clientele or their customer list, oftentimes they'll say, well, hey, I just lost one of my top salespersons. I can't prevent that individual from having their career 
but how do I prevent them from taking my customers away and bringing it to their new employer? It's a great question. And it's one that's in litigation constantly that I deal with. Uh, the best way it, to be prepared for this is to, uh, before there's litigation, at the, at, the, at the outset when hiring employees, when training employees, is to ensure that there are confidentiality agreements that recognize the value of the customer list and, and the value and the expense of developing it that the employer has brought to the table and that it provides for uh, a competitive advantage over competition. Um, in California, there's a lot of case law that says that employees can prepare to compete while they are working for their employer. And, uh, but there are also cases that, that look at um, customer list issues and whether they've actually been preserved as trade secrets under the trade secret laws of both California and the federal trade secret law. And so it's, it's really important that employers make extra efforts to protect those trade secrets to ensure that they are actually trade secrets that they're protecting so that they can then uh, protect themselves by seeking injunctive relief or other kinds of relief, uh, damages relief under the uh, the federal DTSA or the state's uh, unfair uh, trade secret act. So that that's really the only protection that there will be for those types of things. And you have to be really careful because, you know, in cases where competition is known, where employers put that information of who the who the customers are on their website, um, there are sometimes very good arguments that that customer lists are not as confidential as they used to be. Um, you know, LinkedIn, it, it seems to me is a, I've seen that as a really big problem to enforcing uh, customer list issues where employees go out and link with their customers as friends on a personal basis, and then they will target them, uh, you know, through LinkedIn and other kinds of social media. So it's a really interesting thing, and, and we help uh, employers who are looking to hire employees from competitors with these situations and how to protect themselves from lawsuits as well as employers who are trying to protect uh, customer lists and other trade secrets. We had a question in the chat uh, from Rob Hill. What if an employee is asked to sign an agreement that says that they cannot work directly for a client for a period of time? How does that impact? Uh, does that have any impact on a non-compete? Well, I don't think it's a non-compete so much as a non-poach. And so I, I, the FTC has taken the position that that is not only an illegal antitrust type of agreement, but that it is also uh, probably criminally prosecutable by by the federal government. Um, that's that's my view on these things. I know there's a, there there are other ones out there that say, especially in the temp agency world, that you know where they provide for um, like a headhunter fee if if you hire if if a client hires away an employee, that might be enforceable if it's reasonable. But again, if it's going to impede the freedom of mobility and it's going to decrease competition, the FTC is going to take the position that those types of agreements are uh, infringing, infringing on antitrust and, and are, are violations. And the new regulations, by the way, these, these new FTC regulations on non-competes, they will also make it illegal for an employer that provides uh, training to employees uh, to then be able to be uh, compensated if the employee leaves in a certain amount of time. Many employers have agreements with their employees that if they undergo a certain kind of training and a certain amount of training, but they leave within a certain period that the employee would have to reimburse the employer for those, those training period, for those training costs. And this will become uh, illegal under the, uh, the, the regulations. And the regulations will require employers with non-competes, not only to, not only that they're not enforceable, but they're going to have to go out and notify any employees with the non-competes that the uh, non-competes are no longer enforceable, um, you know, in an affirmative, individualized manner, according to the regs. Wow, that's really good information. And thanks so much for putting the link to your blog in the chat, if folks want to learn more about it. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Did we have any other questions for Dan on non-competes? Thanks, Anita. Thanks, everybody. I'll be around. Thanks so much. All right. We're going to take a California corner moment with Nancy Whitehead and learn a little bit more about how arbitration agreements are now viewed and how, how they can or cannot be enforced in our golden state. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Anita.
And I am not certain actually how many of you are California. I know that um, some of you are from, from other states, but as California goes, so goes the country often in, in these things. So it's always, it's always worth knowing what's going on here. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that um, you know, employers in general, and, and, and by the way, I am also a, an employer side employment law attorney. I'm with Scott and Whitehead in Newport Beach. We're a small boutique firms focusing on representing employers. And our clients, as many employers in the state, uh, prefer to have disputes with their employees covered by an arbitration agreement, which means that any lawsuits claims, disputes go to arbitration rather than going into the court system. And back um, 20 years ago or so, it, there, was, there were lots of different options on that and lots of different ways to look at whether or not it made sense to have an arbitration agreement for an employer because um, th the primary advantage to arbitration was time and avoiding a jury. So first of all, you could have a set appointment for your arbitration and you didn't, so that you didn't have to sit around and wait every time you'd show up in court with multiple appearances needed. Um, and also you, you could eliminate the need for a jury. But for a small employer, sometimes deciding whether or not to have an arbitration agreement it was kind of a toss up because the downside to arbitration is that it's not appealable for the most part. There are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, you get an arbitration award, it's pretty hard to challenge that. Where if you go through a regular court, there's all kinds of ways you can challenge a jury verdict. So we used to think of it as, you know, that we'd have discussions about the pros and cons. Well, over the last 10 years or so, um, part of what's changed is there's been an explosion in class action litigation in California. Wage and hour class actions are, I think, the primary um, employment law cases being filed now. If you look in California settlement reports, the wage and hour class actions are exploding and the dollar amounts are exploding, where an arbitration agreement, a well-drafted arbitration agreement, can remove an employee's an employee from being able to bring a class action. So we can have a provision that says that an, the employee waives their right to bring class claims. And that has worked to avoid wage and hour class actions. However, of course, as all things, um, the legislature is always trying to, in, in California, the legislature is always trying to give employees that additional leg up so we have the Private Attorney General Act, which allows employees to bring, and any employee can bring claims for any wage and hour violation, as long as the employees experience some violation, they can bring a claim on behalf of all other employees. And some of you may know that the U.S. Supreme Court is looking at whether or has looked at whether the Private Attorney General Act claims can be subject to an arbitration agreement and has kind of thrown one of the issues back to the California Supreme Court to decide. So we are waiting right now on the California Supreme Court to decide whether an individual employee who's subject to an arbitration agreement can pursue the Private Attorney General Act claims, even though the individual employee's own claims might be subject to arbitration. And the Supreme Court is, uh, the California Supreme Court is, we're waiting on a ruling on that. So in my own practice, my private attorney general act claims are sort of in this holding pattern. What's happening, and I, I went, I recently went to a panel discussion of a number of judges that are handling these cases, and uniformly what they've said is they get a private attorney general act claim that has an arbitration agreement. They are staying the case. They're putting a hold on the case while they wait for the California Supreme Court to decide this issue about whether an individual who has an arbitration agreement can pursue the Private Attorney General Act claims. So that's one thing that's happening that is not necessarily anything that employers can do right now, other than to make sure that if you have an arbitration agreement, it has a class action waiver and a representative action waiver. And what our advisable agreement says, what our recommended agreement says, is that to the extent allowed by law, all claims, including class actions and representative actions, are covered by the arbitration agreement. 
The next thing we've seen recently is if you have employees doing signing their arbitration agreements electronically, you really want to make sure that you are able to authenticate and verify that it's that employee and no one else who is signing that agreement. We recently had a case here where the employer had the arbitration agreement, had it docu-signed. The employee claimed he'd never seen it. He said he had his wife do all the signing and the employer was unable to verify that it was actually the employee and, the, and only the employee who had signed the document. So you, if you have, if you use DocuSign or some other process, you want to make sure that you have something in place that it can only be done at the work site or can only be done with verification of a driver's license or something to verify that it is your employee who's signing it and not some other person. Because again, if, it, if it's challenged, what happens is you bring your motion to compel arbitration if there's a lawsuit filed, um, you have the arbitration agreement, but if the employee says, I've never seen that, I did not sign that, then it's up to the employer to prove that it's actually the employee who signed it. That's different than if the employee says, I don't remember signing it. If the employee says, I don't remember signing it, you're still okay because it's signed. But again, if the employee says, I didn't sign it, that's when you can have a problem. The third thing I'd like to point out is, and this is, um, I think becoming, uh, it's a trap for the unwary for employers in California. So a couple of years ago, the California legislature passed a, a amendment to the arbitration provisions that says that if the arbitration fees are not paid within 30 days of their due date, then the arbitration is deemed waived by the, by the party that is seeking to enforce arbitration. Now for employers, all fees need to be paid by the employer for the most part. I mean, there's some initial filing fees that if the employee had to pay a few hundred dollars to file an action in court, those fees can be charged to the employee, but all other arbitration fees are due by the employer. And under this statute, if the employer does not pay those fees within 30 days of the date they are due, then the arbitration is deemed waived. And what that means is you can't go back. You can't say, well, it's only a few days late because the courts, we have many decisions now where if it's only a few days late, they still say, no, nope, you waived it. Well, then to add an, an additional twist, about a year later, the legislature amended the statute again to say that when the arbitration agencies send out the invoices, they must be due on receipt unless otherwise stated in the agreement. So you are an employer, you have an employee, perhaps your employee has sent in the demand for arbitration. Maybe you didn't even have to make a motion to compel. The arbitration agency sends you the invoice and it says it's due on receipt. And if that's not paid within 30 days, then you've waived arbitration. Now, what we've done here in our recommended form is because the statute says that, um, that if it doesn't provide otherwise, it's due on receipt, we've added a provision that it's that in any arbitration that is brought, we, we recommend JAMS, but different agencies, different employers like other entities, um, that the invoice will be due 30 days after receipt. I mean, there's nothing magical about that. We just tried to pick a number that would give a little bit more time because 30 days for, especially um, for big companies, these invoices often they get routed to different places. They get lost in the mix. There's no intention not to pay. It just doesn't happen. So um, we've added a provision to just try to give a little bit more time. I would expect if that becomes common, the legislature is going to figure out a way to, to invalidate that too. But as for now, the takeaway for this is if you have a matter in arbitration, get that invoice paid as soon as you receive it, do not wait, do not go through your regular process if at all possible, because if more than 30 days passes, then 
you will be back in court and your arbitration agreement will not be enforced. Wow, thank you, Nancy, for covering that for us. Dan, looks like you've got a question. I do, and, and a couple of comments. But we've actually set up a process in-house so that any AAA or JAMS or other ADR provider invoices get you know, fast track to the uh, billing yeah. partners on the cases mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to, to try to take care of that aspect. Uh, but one of, the, one of the advantages I think, Nancy, that, that, that I can't, didn't hear you mention, you may have, uh, to arbitration is privacy, that, that it's not a public forum, that, that, that an employer is insulated from having their dirty laundry spilled all over the place. Uh, and one thing that I've discovered relatively recently is that when you're using the big providers, the JAMs and the AAAs, um, they provide in their disclosures an incredible amount of private information about your clients and your other clients. They will disclose every mediation that you've engaged in with, with those agencies. Um, and I think the fact that you've engaged with mediations, not, and not just with the client who's at issue in the particular arbitration, but, but all kinds of clients. And I think that is just wrong, personally. Um, so I've stopped using both of those providers for, for that reason. That's um, I, I will utilize, I will, I, my arbitration agreements now reference and incorporate the JAMS rules, employment rules, because those are recognized by many courts as being enforceable in California and providing adequate uh, rules and discovery and all those kinds of things. But I will do those, I will use those rules under the rubric of a different uh, provider. And then the other thing that, that, uh, that you mentioned, Nancy, are appeals. So you certainly can also incorporate appellate language into your arbitration agreements so that so that an employer does have the right to uh, appeal some renegade, you know, arbitrator's decisions. Right. right. And and for example, AAA has a appellate panel. You can you can include that in your um your provisions. Right. So but you do need to have that in your agreement or you won't get an appeal, which can be very valuable. And I had a question for you, Nancy, because I've been following this as well. Um, you know, since the since the current on, on the federal level, since arbitrations have been banned from sexual assault claims, um, and the cases I've seen recently have basically said you cannot divide the sexual assault from the other claims, and everything has to go to arbitration. Uh, not, I'm sorry, everything has to stay in court. Right. Uh, obviously, we, as an employer, we'd prefer to be able to sort of send the other claims to arbitration and stay the court action until uh, and, until the arbitration's decided. But have you have you seen any developments in that area? I have not had that situation yet, so I haven't had to. I I haven't personally had to bring the motion or assess the issue. Um, I, I think it's going to be, a, I, th I think eventually we're going to just see the gradual erosion of these claims. For, and so, for example, with confidentiality now, we really can't keep, it's really going to be difficult to keep settlements confidential at all, which then means that the advantage of arbitration and confidentiality, I, I think that all of that is going to start to erode. I, I So... I'm I'm curious about the the um, the exceptions and how that's all going to play out. Yeah. But and the judges want to grant these. I mean, that's also what's what's difficult. At least in my experience, it, you know, judges are happy to get these cases off their docket, but they there are so many constraints on them now that it's going to become more and more difficult. But but just make as long as everybody's making sure that it's much as possible their arbitration agreements are current and that they aren't using something from you know several years ago because we are we are right now in a situation of trying to enforce agreements that clients have had for several years and and it's it's tough it's tough you mean you mean clients go to the internet and google That's arbitration right. and then That's put right. that into their handbook yes Yes, absolutely. Yep. Or they only put it in the handbook, right? There's no right. standalone agreement. There's no, you must have a standalone agreement. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nancy, I had a question about arbitration agreements. And of course, we're happy to take other questions as well. <clears throat> so one of the desirable things about arbitration agreements is to make them mandatory. Right now, you can make them mandatory in California. 
which means that there's a condition of employment, right? So it, yes. honestly, it's easier to get these signed when you have a new hire who's onboarding, you throw them a whole bunch of paperwork and they're likely to sign, just make sure their wife isn't signing for them, I guess, right? Um, but how about, you know, so where, where my clients are, or even the HR contact at the client will raise a question is to say, if, if this is a mandatory condition of employment, I don't know that I see us enforcing it with someone who's a star performer and, and just kind of a contrarian, someone who doesn't want to sign it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that question. And then there's, what if my, what, what if there, we have over 400 employees and we can't possibly track the return of all of, you know, we'll do our best, but some folks, I mean, do we follow up with them for six months for when do we lower the hammer and say, damn it, you didn't sign. Um, yeah. What, so the star performer, I mean, I mean, it becomes a business decision, really. It just becomes, you know, how important is that person? And and is that person then going to um, lead others to not sign? And and it, you've just got to make that business decision about how important it is. And is there some incentive you can give? Because we will often recommend, you know, give a give an incentive to to everybody who signs it. Give them a gift card. Give them something in exchange for signing. I mean, we've had several clients recently, new clients who've come to us that have had some uh, wage and hour issues. They've not always been doing things correctly. And maybe there's a little risk of a claim out there on the horizon, no actual claim yet, but a risk of a claim. And uh, typically the first thing we suggest is get every, all your employees to sign arbitration agreements with class action waivers, representative action waivers to the extent that's gonna be enforceable. And surprisingly, I mean, it's great if you can also do it in connection, say, with an updated handbook. Um, but in our experience, most people sign them. You know, they you get you get a workforce, they meet with everybody, they say, we've got new arbitration, we've got new policies, new arbitration agreements. Here it is. People sign them. For the most part. Gotcha. So and then you can have an opt-out clause, or is there a certain time limit where you can say if, if you don't opt out by this time, you're presumed to be in compliance with this? So there is a case where where actually um the employee had her lawyer send, I think the lawyer sent an email saying uh, my client doesn't agree to this, but the employee kept working. And the court found that because she kept working, she was held bound by the arbitration agreement because she knew that the company, um, a condition of employment was the arbitration agreement. So I would say it depends on how the, the agreement is phrased. Um, I wouldn't provide an opt-out choice if, if that's, unless you want to. Again, it's, you know, I've, I have employers that worry about, especially, um, if you're in an industry where it's really hard to keep people as employees, it can become part of your business decision on is it, you know, do you have a higher risk that you're going to lose a, a lot of people if you make this mandatory, or do you have a higher risk of the, your, you know, having claims out there that aren't covered by an arbitration agreement? But for the most part, I would say get everybody to sign them, don't allow opt outs. It's, it's, it's important. It can be expensive. You know, the, the the one thing to know in California as an employer, because you have to pay all the fees, you have a one week arbitration. It, it's fifty thousand dollars at least just right off the bat before you spend any money on the attorney and getting ready for the arbitration. The arbitrator fee will be what, 50 to 75? I don't know, Dan, if that's your experience. Yeah, 70 is usually a. Usually jams AAA demand seventy thousand dollar deposits for five day arbitration, something like yeah. that. And if you settle the case a month before, that's probably too late because you will have. I mean, some of your you get some of it back. Each I think each judge actually has their own, or each arbitrator has their own timing on that. Yeah. But um, they'll refund some, but they're they're you're not going to get it all back. So. So you need, you need a, getting people to sign on. Something I like to do with current employees 
is to have them sign it, but have the agreement not actually in effect for like two weeks or, or 30 days. Um, that way, I think I've got a really good argument that by choosing to stay employed, that the agreement is enforceable uh, and, and the, you know, you avoid the claims that they were coerced into doing it and economic duress and all that kind of stuff, because then you've given them time to seek employment elsewhere, um, you know, during that, that window period. Uh, and so that's, again, it's a strategy. It's not 100% guaranteed that people will sign it, but I think that in terms of if you're trying to convince them to sign it, you can say, oh, it's not gonna be in play for a couple of weeks. So sign up today. I see that Sarah had a question. Do you still think arbitration is worth it for employers considering the costs? So it all depends on how many employees they have. If you have, I really, if, if you have less than 10 employees, okay, maybe it's a toss up. But right now, the value of getting a class action waiver in California, it's, it's worth the fees for arbitration because you have an, a, a company with 50 employees, you get a wage an hour class action and you haven't been giving proper meal breaks, that case is gonna be worth half a million dollars. Pretty, you know, it all depends on how bad your records are, but avoiding having to pay those wage an hour class action damages um, is worth the arbitration agreement. So, you know, I have I have clients that range from two employees to twenty thousand employees. You know, it, 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 so you have two employees. No, probably not. It's probably not worth it because they're not going to get a class action anyway. You have eight employees. Maybe they won't get a class action. You have more than ten. Well, maybe they will get a class action. So, it, it that tends to be the assessment that I go through. I think that's right. The other part of Sarah's question was about whether uh, about getting dismissal prior to hearing. And again, build into the arbitration agreement, you know, that you can get summary adjudication and the standard on which the arbitrator should award summary adjudication. Because you're absolutely right. There's a lot of arbitration, a lot of arbitrators who disfavor, you know, summary adjudication. And sometimes like the JAMS rules, I think you have to send a letter to get permission to file a summary adjudication uh, motion. Yeah. The other thing I really try to do. I try to, if we're going to mediate an arbitration matter, I try to get it into mediation before we even have to pay the hearing fee. Uh, because at least then you know your timing is such that you're you're not going to lose that big deposit. Thank you so much once again, Nancy, and appreciate your adding, adding value to this, Dan, as well. It was great coverage of the topic. And I think relevant. Like you said, if it starts in California, it's going to spread. <laughs> it can and will. Um, going back to national trends, something that wasn't unique to California, but certainly has been a growing trend. Dane, you're going to help us understand a little bit more about the popular trend of adopting privacy laws and what they cover. Thanks for being with us here this afternoon, Dane. Yep. Thanks, Nita. Hello, everyone. Uh, so when I Set a list of things to Anita. This is the one she said we should talk about. And and what I had listed on there is actually there's actually two things going, two big things going on with privacy at the state among the states. The biggest thing is not employment specific. So we're going to hit on both. But there's um, one, two, there's five, six states that have passed very. Pretty strict Consumer Privacy Act, and it does it does apply to employers to the extent those employers are keeping extensive data about their own employees, and particularly when they start sharing it with vendors. Um, they do that for various reasons, but I just wanted to flag that I think it's just a trend that we started in the early two thousands with getting a lot of privacy laws at the state level related to biometric data of employees. And so that's what we're gonna talk about um, a little bit here, but I just wanted to flag that what we're seeing is that that expand in California, Virginia, Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, and Iowa in 2025 have passed um, pretty strict Privacy Act 
which is just like what kind of data can you collect generally from your clients, from consumers, from, from anybody? How do you store it? What kind of disclosures do you have to give? It's, um, it's, it's just a, it, and to me, it, it builds upon the biometric data statutes that have been passed in, I think eight, eight or nine states have biometric and there's about, there's over 20 that have proposed legislation. So I would think in the next two years, you're gonna have about half the states with pretty substantial biometric data um, statutes on, on the books. And what those generally, I mean, California, California actually didn't lead the way here for once. Uh, it was Illinois, I think, that, that had the BIPA law, but California has very strict biometric data um, protection as well. So uniformly, most of these require that you have informed consent first and foremost of your employees. So you're not allowed to collect information about them. And when you think about biometrics, uh, we're talking about simple things like if you're asking your employees to use their fingerprints to sign for a time clock or to their face recognition to log onto the computer, or if you're providing a cell phone uh, to them and they're using face recognition or finger swipes for that. But what I had raised with Anita was that there's a lot of new technology that's coming into the workplace that is collecting substantially more biometric data about employees. So if you think about like warehouse workers, Amazon probably uh, is pioneering this, but you've got tons of wearable equipment that uh, it's tracking the movements of the workers so that they can identify when there's uh, potential ergonomic issues or if an employee can't move fast enough from one spot to the next. Uh, or, I mean, there's plenty of GPS tracking that goes, goes on. That's not like taking their biometric data, but it can, can create discrimination issues. Uh, but things that I think that many of us think, don't really think twice about unless you're in California or Illinois, um, it can cause substantial liability for merely thinking something is a good idea and, and collecting data about employees that has to be done in a very thoughtful manner. Um, so during COVID, the other thing people did was they took temperatures of everybody, you know? Uh, people, I had clients who set up these automatic systems where you walked through and a camera just, um, it recognized their, sometimes it took a photo of them. Sometimes you had somebody staring at a monitor watching and you could see the numbers or the temperature of what the person's temperature was as they walked past and somebody was monitoring that. So that that was data, that data was transferred to at least one person who was watching. Some, a lot of employers stored the data of, of what employees' temperatures were. were. Some people thought, uh, oh, we need to, to maintain this so that we can prove that we only allowed employees who didn't have a temperature that walk in. There were ways to get around that, but not everybody you know, followed the same, same process. So uh, these, uh, I think this topic was just meant to flag how simple things that seem like a very good idea can create employers collecting information that might be sensitive and in many states now have strict requirements that number one, you, you have informed consent from the employee. So in some states like California, you're gonna have to, it has to be written. It has to not only tell them what you're collecting, but it has to tell the employee what it potentially can be used for. So once the information is collected, if the employer decides later that, man, that data would be useful for us to do something else, can't do it in California. Thank you, know, you very data. much. Thank oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. And so data is, is king in all businesses these days. And it's just going to, the trend is just going to increase more and more. Um, so informed consent, then the laws deal with 
how how the data has to be stored and specifically like who is allowed to ever see it. Uh, and then laws, you wouldn't think you need this, but laws that say you can't use the data to discriminate. Now, no one's probably intentionally doing that, but the problem is, is when you start, even with the ergonomic type stuff, let's say, or, or um, sometimes it there's things that monitor certain employees' heart rate so that they know if someone's um, if they're working in a dangerous spot, if they might be hyperventilating or having a heart attack or something where they might fall, where they're working around dangerous equipment. Um, but if somebody keeps triggering that, it might be an underlying health condition. And so you, you know, you've just got layers and layers of problems here because you could be implicating the ADA at, at that point uh, because you're you're trying to help the employee and ensure that they they don't get hurt, but your decisions based on something that ultimately could be um, considered a disability. And then of course, laws very strict about, I guess this goes with confidential storage, but they, they pull it out separately. Like you can't sell the data, you can't share it for, for anyone's with your vendors or other things without it being locked down in the same way. Um, Dan, thank you, I have a question. Uh, yeah, just, um... A couple of things, you know, since we're in a national forum, albeit 14 of us, for, for at least for California and probably for the other states that I mentioned, you have to be aware of your remote employees. So even if you're a New York uh, based organization, but you have remote employees in those states, you may be, and certainly in California, you're going to be subject to California's CPRA. Um, I'm also getting my certification as a privacy lawyer. So uh, I've been doing some work in this area, Dane. Um, and and in California, you not only have to give, you don't need signed consent from your employees, but you do need to give them notice. You need to give applicants notice about the private information that, that you're going to be gathering from them. Um, and what's really disconcerting, I think, especially in California, is employees have now have the right to have private information corrected or deleted, as do former employees. And that's just going to create a whole plethora of issues down the road. I think that in California, um, these types of issues are going to be are going to come under the PAGA jurisdiction. There's going to be private attorney general enforcement, uh, which means you know plaintiff lawyer fees basically and massive amounts of litigation. Yeah, so in California, as I understand it, it, it doesn't have to be signed, but it has to be written. Whereas like Texas and Washington doesn't. Um, you have to have consent, but it doesn't have to be written. However, you're going to. Right. If somebody thinks they can do that without putting it in writing, okay, <laughs> probably not the best idea. Um, so the other thing to think about is like employee facing apps and internal messaging. Uh, all of these privacy issues apply to those. Uh, we're moving back away from biometric now to just the general privacy, new privacy laws. But as you have people sharing information internally and it's on an employee employer provided platform, uh, the employer can wind up being liable for the information that employees, certainly managers, but sometimes when employees are sharing information about each other that uh, the employer would be allowed to share. What a tangled web we have. Yeah. I would <laughs> say if your takeaways for this is you need, everybody should have a written privacy policy um, and, and ensure you're getting consent. It's probably the two big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that um, when we've gone in and, and we've just looked at um, administration, you know, personnel records and how, how employers keep those, we'll find that oftentimes they'll, uh, maybe the payroll contact will have their own cheat sheet where they copy over the social security number and date of birth and create their own cheat sheet to help them upload it into payroll, but then keep that in the personnel file. And at least in California, you're not allowed to do that. If you're doing it for whatever reason, shred that piece of paper, don't hold on to it. If you need to do something to help you get that information into payroll, shred it afterwards. But now there's a lot of electronic onboarding, which takes care, which takes that concern away more and more. Um, but where there's a standalone agreement, like Nancy said, make sure you get that bona fide signature 
I, I still tell my clients when it's a standalone agreement, get wet ink. Nothing is better than getting wet ink. You'll think you're saving time until you need to prove that that was what that individual did. <clears throat> so. And save the wet ink. <laughs> don't, don't put a blank on your file and say, oh, they signed it. <laughs> save it. Yes. <laughs> and you go through the trouble of doing that. Well, we can't thank our speakers enough for providing such an informative session today. And although we didn't have as many as we would have hoped live, I'm so glad that this call is being recorded and will be available to all High Rise members. Um, we look forward to keeping you on your toes and we like to hear from you all. So if you've got other topics that you'd like to learn more about, feel free to send them to me directly or you can send them to Sean either way. We look forward to keeping you informed. Thanks again, Dan, Nancy, and Dane, and Sean. Appreciate the opportunity to keep High Rise informed of employment developments. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye now. Take your time.